Okay, so I'll move on to IJ nephropathy studies. And uh, I think, uh, as John mentioned, it would be safe to say that about 10 to 15 years ago, there wasn't a huge amount of interest in doing clinical trials in IJ nephropathy. And I think the reasons are because that it is a fairly rare condition, um, uh, as we can see, and, and um, the condition tends to progress fairly slowly as well over kind of years to 10, 10 15 years. And um, so it would, um, it takes a lot of effort to do these studies and a lot, uh, and the studies I'll talk about uh, are taking place over several different countries um, in order to get the kind of numbers required um, uh, to, to, to find uh, any, uh, any findings. Um, but there has been a real change over the past kind of five to ten years, and um, these are the number of studies that have now been uh, published and reported on uh, globally um, within the last five years. And I'll take you through some of these very briefly. So, uh, just to go through how IJ nephropathy uh, develops, I think we talked about it this morning, but we have uh, here a cartoon of your antibody producing cells. Uh, producing the IgA that is subtly different in IgA nephropathy uh, that then goes on to form immune complexes that travel in the bloodstream and then deposit uh, within the kidney uh, that that causes the damage in terms of causing inflammation, uh, scarring and uh, damage to uh, kidney function. So we can target this in different ways and many of you would have heard of steroid therapy and, and, and some of you would have uh, perhaps been on, on on steroids as well. So there's been a number of clinical trials and interest in steroids, both as a way of kind of dampening down uh, antibody production and to try and dampen down that inflammation. Um, and it's important to note, I think, that um, obviously um, I'll talk about the studies, but individual circumstances uh, might vary about why certain people have been put onto steroids. So these findings won't necessarily apply. But this was one of the big studies uh, from Germany um, that compared um, uh, intensive supportive care, so really focusing on blood pressure control, uh, lifestyle measures, salt reduction, uh, smoking, uh, stopping smoking, exercise, um, uh, uh, plus uh, compared to um, um, uh, adding in um, medications to suppress the immune system, which included steroids. And the finding from this study, uh, the, the bottom line, uh, was that the addition of uh, drugs to suppress the immune system that included steroids uh, did not significantly improve the outcome. And more uh, side effects, including kind of serious infections, were observed amongst the patients who received the medications to suppress the immune system. Uh, but it's really important to note from this study um, that after uh, so everybody received this kind of intensive, um, um, what they call intensive supportive care, so focusing on blood pressure, lifestyle measures, etc., at the start of the study. And when they did that, about a third of patients uh, responded uh, to, to these measures and didn't actually, uh, and improved and didn't actually follow through into the main study. Uh, this is another steroid uh, study uh, looking at uh, the effect of uh, methylprednisolone, another uh, form of steroids in uh, patients with IgA nephropathy. It took place in, in Asia and Australia. Um, these, this study was using, I think, far higher doses of steroids than might be used um, uh, in here or, or in the US. Um, but. But the bottom line for this study was that the study had to be stopped early uh, because of an increased risk of serious uh, uh, ad adverse events, uh, especially infections, and some of those were serious, and there were actually two deaths in uh, the patient's, uh, patient group receiving steroids. Um, although there was potential benefit in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of the <coughs> kidney outcomes also, so they're re now repeating this study using a lower dose of the steroid, and we'll wait to see what those results show. So th that's the testing study. Uh, but what's been very interesting over the last few years is now targeted uh, therapy. So John talked about this this morning as well. 
So there's this form of steroid uh, called nephicon, which is a targeted released uh, budesonide, which is just released in the, the kind of um, um, uh, part of the small bowel, uh, which contains a lot of these um, uh, immune cells uh, that generate the IgA. Um, and here we've got a picture of that nephicon uh, and a uh, picture of where it is active. And, and the interesting about, thing about this drug and how it's, uh, uh, how it's kind of formulated is it's designed to be released there and it's designed to uh, undergo breakdown in the liver so it doesn't really enter into the uh, circulation. And the idea is that hopefully this would reduce some of the side effects associated with steroids. And this was a, a shorter phase two study. Uh, so uh, if you remember the kind of earlier on uh, st uh, study, uh, but in this study, they found uh, that nine months of treatment uh, reduced uh, the level of protein leak, which is associated with reducing the risk of future kidney damage. So this study is now in a phase three study um, uh, called the Nefigard study. Uh, that's open within the UK. Um, it's going to look at Nefigard uh, for nine months and look at long-term outcome to see if that uh, uh, reduction in protein leak uh, can be replicated in a larger group of people or whether it leads to beneficial outcomes in, 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 in kidney function as well. <coughs> okay, and that's recruiting uh, in several different countries, uh, including UK and many centres, and I know Glasgow is, is, is one centre for, for this study. Okay, what about the um, antibody producing uh, cells, the B cells themselves? Um, so there is clearly interest in, in looking at these cells as the source of IgA. Um, this was a small study uh, done looking at a drug called rituximab. Um, some of you might have heard of this medication. It's been used now quite widely in uh, other conditions like vasculitis, uh, lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but there was no benefit um, um, uh, in this uh, study in IJ nephropathy. And it might be uh, that this drug didn't actually uh, affect the specific cells uh, that produce that subtly abnormal IgA um, in IgA nephropathy. So there's other uh, drugs that are, uh, are being tested uh, in this condition. Uh, two of these studies have completed now the Blisibimod study, the Bright SC study, and the Takisep study. Uh, and we'll wait to see what the results uh, uh, come from, from those studies. Okay, um, and finally, uh, looking at uh, the kidney itself and what, how we can intervene uh, when the, the IgA uh, gets stuck on these filters and causes the inflammatory damage. Um, so I'm going to mention uh, another phase three study now uh, called the PROTECT study. So this is a study of sparsentan, which is a new uh, drug in its class of a combination angiotensin receptor blocker, so the ARB, the SARTAN, uh, with an, uh, what's known as an endothelin uh, receptor blocker. And this drug has um, shown to be, uh, uh, had a positive uh, effect in, uh, in a phase two study in a, another kidney condition called FSGS, or focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Um, so, uh, and the idea with this, uh, uh, with this drug is that it has um, potential uh, anti, uh, well, beneficial effects on different kidney cell types, including the kidneys, uh, the cell types that surround the filters and the cell types uh, within the kidney as well. Uh, so this is a big phase three study about, uh, I think they're looking to recruit around 300 patients uh, globally. Again, it's open in Glasgow and in other centres in the UK, in, including Leicester. Um, and uh, this uh, study will be uh, of taking this medication um, uh, for two years versus the uh, active control, which is uh, another SARTAN, uh, and to, to look to see if this produces uh, uh, beneficial outcomes. Um, so, so that was a uh, sparse answer. So, so when after IgA deposits on the filters, um, then we know that uh, a kind of 
the immune system uh, can react to that. And, and uh, there's part of the immune system uh, called the complement system, which reacts to that IgA being stuck on. And that can cause a cycle of increasing inflammation and scarring in the kidney as well. And there's uh, a new uh, drug, drug trial that's just opened in Leicester and is open in other countries as well, uh, called uh, a drug um, uh, studying the effects of uh, a drug called chemdizaran. Uh, this is a phase two study. Um, we talked at lunchtime. I think uh, th there's somebody into this study already uh, from the UK. And this is using a new technique uh, to, call, uh, to do with gene silencing uh, to knock down uh, production of one of these complement components um, with the idea of reducing that kind of complement cycling and the inflammatory uh, process. Um, so that's quite a, a new novel way of using, uh, using therapies that target genes <coughs> to try and reduce that process. There's a lot of interest in the complement system and how that's overactive in IJ neuropathy. And there's a lot of other different complement inhibitors which are coming soon uh, to trials. And after the IJ neuropathy, uh, after the IGA uh, deposits in the kidney, there are other kind of inflammatory processes that get uh, increased. Uh, one of the pathways which we were very interested in uh, was the spleen tyrosine kinase pathway, or SICK for short. Uh, and I don't, uh, if, for those of you that have been to previous talks, uh, Fred Tam talked about um, the use of the inhibitor fostamatinib, or, or the SIGN study. Um, and that's now completed, and we're waiting for the results from that. <coughs> OK, so that's probably all I was going to talk about, about uh, uh, specific studies. So I was going to take a step back and, and, and just oh. mention why you might want to take part in a clinical trial. Well, I think without uh, clinical trials, we would never improve our understanding of the condition and things would never move forwards. Um, so we're very extremely grateful uh, to people with the condition giving up their time uh, to put themselves forwards for these studies. You might want to access a new treatment that's not available. And many of these studies will have a, a, a phase uh, where after you complete the first uh, part of the study, uh, where you might be randomized to either getting the new treatment or the placebo, where they'll do a, ne a second phase, which is called an open label phase, where everybody will get access to that new treatment. Uh, but by the nature of it, because it's a study, because it's a trial, nobody, uh, we don't really know for certain whether they're gonna have long-term benefits. That's the purpose, of, clearly, of doing the study. Um, but I think some people say to me that it's, it's nice to actually take some ownership as well and take an active role uh, in, in, um, in um, their disease process. Um, and uh, there are clearly drawbacks um, <laughs> to, 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 clinical, to, to taking part in clinical trials. Um, um, certainly, uh, they can be very time consuming, um, uh, especially uh, some of the earlier phase uh, studies. Uh, but we try and schedule kind of study visits around around patients really and often we can combine clinic visits with 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 study visits as well there might be side effects uh, from from additional medications um, and uh, and as i mentioned before we we often don't know what the long-term effects are but often whether by the time these uh, medications come to phase two and phase three studies they've already been through uh, several years of safety studies uh, generally these trials i would say are not suitable for those with uh, reduced kidney function um, because uh, most of them are being used in people with more preserved kidney function uh, as that's perhaps where you would see the most benefit um, also uh, people with extremely kind of um, well, very slowly progressive disease may not uh, be eligible for these studies as well because it might be that any additional kind of trial medication would not make any any difference anyway. Um, a lot of these studies have a kind of EGFR cutoff uh, for entry, and and usually that's set around the thirty mark, but but each trial will will differ for that. Um, they're not. They don't. Uh, these studies that I mentioned are not suitable for those on dialysis, uh, and there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no studies 
uh, available at the moment for those who've had a kidney transplant to look at um, how we treat patients who have uh, IJ that recurs in the transplant, although that's clearly a very um, a, a, an area that needs to be studied. How do you find out more? So I would uh, I would say to contact your own uh, your your kidney units, your kidney doctors. Um, but I'll point to you, I'll, I'll point out some websites that I think are, are pretty useful as well, and I'll show you examples of those. Um, you can contact either myself or uh, John, uh, who's really been um, uh, involved very heavily in the design of many of these uh, global studies. Um, those are email addresses or, or Twitters. Um, so the first website, the UK Clinical Trials Gateway. So, so if you just Googled that, uh, you'd, you'd get to this website. And, and here you can kind of search for a study, uh, so for the condition and where you are. And I did this a couple of days ago. So I put in IJ nephropathy in Glasgow then. I found the Nefigard study at the top and the sparse scent and the Protex study there. And you can click into those and find out a bit more detail about the individual study, the, the kind of, um, if you're eligible, uh, the rationale, uh, and, and, and so on. And I, I would also point out that um, many of these studies now have got really good websites as well uh, that you can find out more about, um, uh, about each individual uh, trial. Uh, this is the NEFCURE website, which I think was developed in the US, but is now kind of being rolled out um, uh, more globally now. Um, and again, you can put in your uh, postcode and, and what you're interested in. And here I put in uh, the postcode for this hotel and, and it brought up the PROTECT study as well. Uh, so that's the NEFCURE website. And this is the uh, an American website called clinicaltrials.gov, but but all, all studies have to be registered through this. So this is quite a comprehensive uh, website as well. Uh, and again, I put in IJ nephropathy in Glasgow and then got a, got a number of hits about both completed and recruiting studies and then you can filter through and, and find, out, find out more. And clinicaltrials.gov um, uh, gives you a quite interesting map view as well, which tells you about the number of uh, studies going on in IJ nephropathy in the world. And these are the numbers of, of recruiting studies. So you can see seven in Europe, eight in the US, and, and 12 in China. So as we said before, IJ nephropathy is very, is, is, seems to be uh, more common in, in China and Asia, and there's a lot of interest in, in, in research in, in, in those countries as well. So I'll flash up these uh, details again. Um, and uh, this is our uh, clinical uh, research trials team in Leicester uh, over uh, when, when the weather was a bit better this summer. Uh, so thank you for listening.